Hello and welcome to IVF Around the World. It's delightful to have you all back. Welcome to Anastasia, to Arif, to Aswari, to Lamia. Lean Ali, welcome back. Uh, Mohammed Arif, lovely to see you. Nicola, Nora, Turia, and Zainab, to name just but a few. It is absolutely fantastic to have you here. And as always, we have a wonderful program uh, ahead of us. So uh, before we start, just to say, please do uh, put in some questions into the um, uh, into the the question bar because we always like to hear from you. Um, joining us today is uh, Shadi, and joining us is also Melissa and Mayas, all the way from uh, the IVF company. And um, also, we've got the Tri C Academy joining us at the same time. So it's fantastic to have you all here. We have a couple of speakers today. I hope one is just having a little bit of a problem getting through. Um, but uh, before uh, that, we have away from the USA, uh, Dr. Eva Shegman. So Eva um, has uh, got an MS and a PhD, um, and she's been an embryologist since 1992. That's the year that I completed my PhD. Would you uh, would you believe? She did her undergraduate in animal science at Cornell University where she also trained with uh, Robert Foote, who was an early pioneer whose research led to IVF in agricultural livestock and in animal cloning. Um, she obtained her master's degree from Eastern Virginia Medical School in embryology, um, and embryology and andrology, and she's currently working on a PhD in reproductive clinical lab science, also at EVMS. She's got an advanced uh, graduate certificate in clinical bioethics from Hofstra University and is licensed as a technical supervisor of the American Board of Bioanalysis as a clinical lab scientist. She's affiliated with Mellowood uh, Medical as the business and scientific consultant. Um, and for their world, uh, and that's a world pre a premier provider for fertility, for fertility clinic management software. Crikey, that took some saying. And she's also president of Art Lab uh, Consulting, uh, where she provides IVF lab services, teaching and training to IVF clinics. So we are absolutely delighted to hear what she's going to tell us about her training today and how we might work with her um, sometime in the future. So uh, Eva, without further ado, I'm going to pass over to you to tell our audience a little bit more about some of the work uh, that, that you've been doing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to Professor Griffin. We've not yet had the the opportunity to meet in person, so very happy to, to meet all of you here today. Can you see my screen? We can indeed, go for it. Okay, great. So today I'm gonna talk about uh, the discuss discuss the approaches to minimizing environmental stress in the IVF lab from a US perspective. Um, Hold on. Okay, so a few of the disclaimers that uh, Professor Griffin did disclose. I am a business and scientific consultant for Mellowood Medical and their EMR ideas. Uh, I am the president of Art Lab Consulting, so I do provide embryology services and teaching and training uh, to clinics around the world. And I am currently a PhD candidate at EVMS in the US, which is the home of the first US IVF baby in uh, 1981. And my research area focuses on the effect of environmental stress on senescence biomarkers in pre-implantation stage embryos. So first, uh, Melissa, if you could take it away, we're gonna do a quick poll. So let me, okay, poll is open. So- Yeah, so, ladies and gentlemen, can the IVF laboratory influence some mosaicism and or aneuploidy rates in the pre-implantation embryos. Um, so uh, it's one of those Likert scales. So do you strongly agree, somewhat agree? Do you not know? Do you somewhat disagree or do you strongly disagree? Can the IVF laboratory influence the mosaicism and or aneuploidy rates in pre-implantation embryos? What do you think? Our poll is now in progress. Um, and I can say that, well, we're pretty much leaning towards one particular area. I won't tell you what it is yet, uh, but we've got 42% of you have voted already. Um, and I know that we've got about 50 attendees today. So I'm going to close the poll in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Close the poll, if you would, Melissa. 
And I can tell you, um, Eva, that 50% somewhat agree. Um, we have 21% we strongly agree and don't know each, and only 8% somewhat disagree. So um, back to you. Okay, so I have a few of you to, to convince them today, so good. Um, and you can see my slide again, right? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes, we can. Okay, great. So let's move forward. So again, to the question, can the IVF lab affect the outcomes and influence mosaicism and aneuploidy rates? And, you know, my thoughts on that, oh, hold on, got the automatic timer on. Absolutely. And there are many factors that determine viability and health of IVF embryos. Some of these factors are external and clearly beyond the control of the IVF laboratory. But today we're going to focus on those in the IVF lab that can have an effect on outcome success. So variation amongst, among lab protocols is common, and these variations can result in differences in outcomes. And in this study by Mune et al. in 2017, they looked at egg donor cycles. So if you consider this group similar to a control group amongst IVF labs, they're a pretty homogenous group of patients. They're all relatively young, typically good responders, no other infertility diagnoses, and they showed a different, a differing euploidy rate between the IVF centers, and this differed by as much as 40%. So now, we don't know if the errors in these aneuploids were meiotic or mitotic in nature, or what degree of mosaicism existed, if the errors were meiotic in nature, all cells in the embryos will, will, of course, be abnormal. If the embryos were mitotic, occurring at or after fertilization, then the resulting embryo will have some degree of mosaicism with both normal and abnormal cell lines present. Now, some studies have shown significant differences in embryo mosaicism. Uh, Dagan Wells did an abstract in 2016 showing clinics reporting mosaicism as high as 30%. Now, other clinics, similar to the one I came from in the U.S. at CCRM, uh, have reported mosaicism rates as low as 3%. So what could account for these differences? So this would suggest that conditions in the IVF lab could be influencing mitotic division errors, again, which are those occurring after fertilization. So let's first discuss embryonic stress. So under physiological conditions, reactive oxygen species, or ROS, and antioxidants maintain a stable ratio. So in vitro culture can have an impact on embryonic homeostasis. Oxidative stress develops when there is an increase in the levels of ROS, exceeding the cell's antioxidant defenses. So non-optimized lab conditions can lead to environmental stress. This stress can have an impact on embryo function and development, especially at sensitive points like at the oocyte stage. So examples of things that can cause non-optimized conditions are things like pH, toxins, pollutants, temperature, oxygen tension, and culture conditions. So how can we control, th control for these things? Well, the first is going to be proper lab design, but also QC and proper handling of gametes and embryos are going to be critical in minimizing stress. So here's just a pictorial of the early to later blastocyst stage embryos uh, during development. Um, the blastocysts are able to tolerate stress better at these later stages. Uh, and, you know, the embryos are most vulnerable at the earlier stages in the oocyte stage, and that's why it's especially important to have strict controls over their environment at this point. So let's start talking about what really matters in the IVF lab. Um, well, this report from the Cairo consensus, I think, states it perfectly, which is it's everything. Um, the Cairo consensus represents the outcomes from an international expert meeting to try to establish consensus guidelines for IVF culture. They did establish more than 50 consensus points on things ranging from HVAC to countertops to computers, and we'll cover some of those points here today. So if you have not read this report, I highly suggest that you download it. So I've broken down this talk into three sections. So first, we're going to briefly talk about lab design, and much starts there at the beginning. Then we're going to talk about gamete and embryo handling, and lastly, about troubleshooting. So how do we know when it's going wrong, and how do we use QC to improve outcomes? So I know there's a lot crammed on this slide, but designing a lab is critical to your long-term success. So air quality in urban cities can have high levels of pollutants, and these can include carbon monoxide, nitrous oxide, heavy metals, and sulfur dioxide, to name just a few. And these would not be things that you would typically want in your air in the IVF lab. 
So, however, indoor air can also have its own pollution issues. Construction materials, flooring, paints, adhesives all contain a large amount of VOCs or volatile organic compounds. Even things like floor cleaners and bathroom cleaners can be very toxic, and these typically may be hidden away from view in a closet. So in basic considerations also, think about your workflow when designing a lab. You don't want to be carrying embryos across long distances, and you also don't want multiple workstations bottlenecked in a small area or located in a high traffic flow area. This could certainly cause um, some catastrophic accidents. So also, you know, design your lab with proper lighting. We're not really going to go into too much detail on that today, but you typically will use LED or incandescent lights and prefer, preferably dimmable. Um, and you do want to try to avoid fluorescent lighting where possible. You want to make sure that your equipment you select is for the proper size for your caseload you're predicted to be doing. So for example, if you're doing 500 plus cases a year, you certainly don't want to be operating with just one incubator. You want to choose the right equipment, know what type of sensors they use and what type of recovery rates they have. And obviously cost is always an issue, so you do want to price compare between vendors. And if you're looking for used equipment, however, tr trust your source. You certainly want to be weary of online sites where you don't know where this equipment or what this equipment was used for in the past. So building materials, um, some of these low and no VOC products used to be very difficult to find. I know especially when we were building new labs back in the 90s, but they become more mainstream nowadays. And you know, typically, at least here in the US, you'll find them in most of the big box stores. Um, but all paints, adhesives, even insulation should be low or no VOC. Your gas line piping should be stainless and copper brazed or use Tigon tubing. And there are some concerns with copper sulfate with uh, humidity in the gas lines. But always be sure to use uh, adequate inline filters and not just um, inline gas and inline um, uh, HEPA gas filters. So ideally, you're going to also want positive pressure in your lab. You want to have the lab sealed as much as possible to avoid leaks. And if anyone has any questions on that, I can certainly answer that later. Um, and while the lab may be an interesting place, you really need to limit the traffic into the lab to critical personnel only, especially to avoid uh, unnecessary distractions. Uh, an HV a dedicated HVAC system I think is crucial and preferably, um, I typically recommend systems like LifeAir or Xander that will have multiple layers of filtration and they're gonna include filters such as our activated, activated carbon, photocatalytic ox oxidation and potassium permanganate filters. So you also want to make sure the lab has the ability to regulate the temperature and the humidity. And you do want to try to keep the humidity levels between 40 and 60 percent. And this should help um, minimize any fungal growth. All right. So here's just a few an example of a few features um, that I like to include in, in lab design. First is a positive pressure monitor. Second is a uh, continuous VOC monitoring device. Um, I use the, the wolf sense. Um, and the third is actually a rendering of one of the HVAC systems. This one is the light first system. Uh, these can be either ceiling or roof mounted, and this one is available outside of the US. All right, so talking a little bit about air quality, uh, you always need to be vigilant about the air in your lab. What you can't see or control can definitely hurt you if you haven't taken proper precautions. So things such as rooftop resurfacing, road resurfacing, construction, renovation, idling en engines, to name a few of the things that you need to be concerned with. Even seasonal pollution can be an issue. So if you live in certain areas prone to wildfires, this can cause extremely poor air quality as well. So when you measure VOCs, you always want to be measuring, just keep in mind, in parts per billion. Many devices or companies will measure in parts per million, and this isn't really sufficient because even parts per billion levels of VOCs can be toxic to your embryos. So I have a couple of slides here that were generously um, shared with me from Life Air. And to talk about does the air filtration really matter? Um, so this one here is a culmination of clinical data from centers pre and post control of their ambient air. So you can see at each level, centers saw overall increase in blast conversion rates, implantation rates, and ongoing pregnancy rates and a decrease in loss rates. So just for an example at a system installed in the UK, here is data from an installation of this unit at King's Fertility. 
So overall, they saw an increase again in the clinical pregnancy rate, implantation rate, and the decrease in their miscarriage rate. So to think about how important this can be for your outcome, what other one thing can you think of changing that could potentially increase your implantation rate by 25%? So air quality is a critical part of your lab, and you need to know how good or bad it is. So again, just to highlight a few of the take-home features on air quality, um, parts per billion levels of VOCs, and I can't stress this strong enough, can be toxic to your embryos. So air quality definitely can have an impact on development, and you need to really be proactive. It's definitely better to install an induct or rooftop unit than a portable one in your lab to try to filter after poor quality air is already there. So I know we didn't talk about it today, but there's also contaminants that can be found in your gas tanks. Um, even the ones that are considered uh, medical grade. So you really want to be sure that you use a high quality inline gas filters and similar those like those ones offered by either CODA or, um, or Life Air. And lastly, remember to change your filters and be on top of it. I've walked into several labs and, and noticed, and one of the first things I've asked is when was the last time their filters were changed and they all kind of look at each other and said, oh, we have a company do that. And when I've asked them to go double check, um, you know, their contract had expired the year previous and nobody had noticed that the filters were never changed. So let's briefly talk about how to validate uh, a new lab once it's been built. So one of the other strong things I recommend is don't rely on the contractors. So I've had times when they've said they've used certain approved products and they didn't. Uh, the entire process should really be supervised by the lab staff. So that means being on site during construction or even performing spot checks. So you'll want to make sure the inside of the ductwork is wiped clean before installation. It makes no sense to put in an expensive filtration system, you know, if the ductwork has not been cleaned. So even if it looks clean, go in and wipe it down. You'll be very surprised by what you find. Um, all the equipment should be running and have a burn off, a burn in period of at least two weeks. And you should, again, perform VOC sampling of your lab prior to, to start. Obviously, you're going to want to set up your alarm systems. There are some systems now that do offer real-time monitoring. Um, I typically use the one from, from uh, SafePoint Scientific. And those you can check remotely, even on a mobile device. So it doesn't just alarm when they're out of range. You can monitor everything from your refrigerators to freezers, cryo tanks, and incubators with real-time access. So, and lastly, make sure you perform a one-cell mouse embryo assays on all of your incubators before starting. So, just a few tips on what you can do if you can't build a new lab. So, if you have laminate cabinetry, these do emit VOCs. So, hopefully, you can remove them and install some stainless workbenches. Use low or no VOC products in any renovations around the clinic. And if you don't have a built-in filtration system and you can't install one, then obviously as a last resort, a portable unit can be used to control ambient air. So be sure to test your air if you don't have a, um, an on-site VOC meter. Be sure to perform testing at different time points throughout the year and not just at the same time period. All right, so now let's move on to talk about proper handling of gametes and uh, embryos. I do have to thank uh, Jason Swain. I did work for him for, uh, for a bunch of years and ran his lab in uh, New York City until, um, until just a few years ago. So I learned a tremendous amount about optimizing the lab culture environment from him. And if you haven't read any of his papers, uh, I suggest you please look them up. They're definitely worth, worth the read. So I think most embryologists do recognize that they should measure the pH of their culture media. I think many labs find it difficult to accurately and with confidence find the best way to test pH. Most labs do measure CO2 concentration daily in their incubators, but not pH. And you know, typically you'll measure that monthly or perhaps when you have a new lot number of media. A stable CO2 concentration should lead to a stable pH environment, but you do need to test your pH to trust this for sure. So in the US, I would typically use a device similar to the iStat here on your left for pH uh, testing. It's actually a blood gas analyzer. It's used at the patient bedside in the hospital. And you know we've modified its use for pH testing. So if you don't have this device available, I suggest one, one similar. They're very, very accurate. Um, you're also gonna wanna use a, um, an accurate temperature monitor. 
uh, like a thermocouple. There are some clinics now using even infrared thermometers with, with great success. Just be wary of the old style uh, mercury or alcohol thermometers. They're not that, um, that precise. And also you really wanna make sure you check them for any breaks in the liquid column. I've seen labs, um, like I said, currently testing with the, the infrared devices and having a um, tremendous amount of success. So let's review a bit about pH. Um, I know we could certainly spend an entire talk on, on pH alone, but we're just going to go into a little bit of a background here. Um, so embryos do have a mechanism to regulate pHi, but this process does take energy. And this could impact resources for the embryo, as the embryo must use more resources to maintain proper pHi. So external pH or pHe should range from between 7.15 and 7.35, and pHe can have an effect on sperm binding, motility, oocyte maturation, or embryo development. Since pH can, affect, can impact the stability and function of the meiotic spindle, this could affect proper segregation of chromosome alignment. So it is crucial to avoid pH fluctuations during sensitive periods. Later stage blastocysts are better able to modulate their pHi due to tighter cell junctions. And when you strip the oocytes or you know, even when you've just warmed or thawed embryos, it can take several hours for that embryo to be able to modulate their pHi again. So improper PHI can also affect embryo metabolism and sperm function. So just moving on, let's talk a little bit about temperature. So temperature can also have a major impact on gamete and embryo function and affect the meiotic spindle stability. So, but not all dips below 37 degrees are necessarily harmful. So remember, what's the first step in vitrifying? Well, we take the embryos right out of the incubator and typically place them in room temperature solutions. So now, in general, there is a range to overall body temperature from 36.6 to about 37.3, but what should the gametes and embryos be at? Most labs will typically use 36, but it is believed that the female reproductive tract maintains a lower temperature. So some past studies have shown a possible temperature gradient in the fallopian tube, and some have shown that the temperature in the follicles is lower as well. So perhaps a future incubator will adjust temperature over time based on the stage of the embryo. So that could certainly be an interesting possibility. So I did wanna show you uh, this study by Hong et al. They looked at differing outcomes cult when culturing at 36 Celsius, so 37. And as you can see, they saw a higher blastulation rate with 37 and a higher rate of usable blast as well as a higher implantation rate with 37. But I do think the jury is still out if there is some optimal temperature gradient throughout the stages of gamete and embryo development. So again, back to um, Jason's paper for optimizing culture environment, here's looking at oxygen tension. I think clearly with the low oxygen environment, there were improved clinical pregnancy rates, improved implantation rates, and a higher birth rate. And I hope that everyone by now is using a low oxygen environment, but if not, that definitely needs to be something that you consider. So there are many studies showing the benefits of low oxygen. There are a few that were showing, there are a few that have shown no difference, but those studies may have other variables at play as well. But you know, there are really no studies out there that have shown a benefit to high oxygen culture. So animal papers going back decades have shown improved outcomes with a low oxygen environment. And studies over the, over the years have also shown varying oxygen levels in the female reproductive tract between two and 8%. So again, perhaps the optimal level has not yet been identified. So how we prepare dishes and handle gametes um, is also very important. So do you make your dishes in a heated hood? This could possibly lead to some evaporation. Or if the air is on, how many dishes do you make with the air on before you add the oil? Um, I typically don't do any more than two because these can all affect the quality of the culture dish that you're going to be making. So for culture dishes with 50 microliters of media under oil, just keep in mind that regassing takes about 20 times longer than degassing. So even with oil, the pH will be over 7.4 in less than two minutes. So even if you use a gas funnel, this will only slightly extend this time period and you should use that only as a crutch and should never be replaced um, replaced being in, um, being in an incubator. So also keep in mind that culture media can evaporate even under oil, so the osmolality will rise over time. So if possible, I do suggest a humidified environment. If that's not possible, consider refreshing of the culture media potentially every 48 hours. 
So now on to a little bit of troubleshooting. Um, how do you know when you have an issue? What processes should you be monitoring? Ideally, when you, you should monitor as many processes as possible, which will term your laboratory performance indicators. Um, but as you know, if we, if we monitored every process that we do in the lab, we could typically have a few hundred um, LPIs, but you want to, to have the core, the important ones uh, that you look at at least monthly. Uh, so also, what do you want to use as your outcome indicators? Do you use just initial beta? Um, do you use implantation rate by SAC or by heart rate, or do you, you know, go by live birth rate? You know, obviously you want it, you wouldn't want to just go by live birth rate. It would take you, you know, a very long period of time to get your data, but you also don't want to just use initial beta. You know, you would definitely miss if there, you know, was um, a period of time where there was an increase in the miscarriage rate. So you want to be able to monitor your critical processes. I think at least half a dozen, if not more, called your key performance indicators. Um, if you don't have this book by Sharon and David Mortimer, I do suggest that you add it to your library. I've certainly used it as my Bible and QC on many occasions. And now we're going to talk a little bit about the Vienna Consensus Report. So hopefully all of you have, have heard about that. And the Vienna Consensus was a meeting also by a group of experts to put together a consensus on the LPIs, the Laboratory Performance Indicators, and the key performance indicators that should be incorporated into your program. So again, another paper I highly consider you download if you've not, if you've not yet read it. So this is uh, one of the tables from the Vienna Consensus Report, and you know, I think very important to um, consider incorporating into your best practice quality system in your lab. You know, one thing I want to point out is um, to understand the differences between the competency values and the benchmark value. And you never really want to set them um, too low or, you know, too high, depending on what your value you're talking about, where you always meet them. Um, you know, you, you, as you can see for here, for example, for the ICSI damage rate, for competency, it's set at 10%. Um, but benchmark is target or target is at 5%. So you want to be sure you don't set your benchmark too low in this case, where it's easily attainable all the time. So for example, for competency, it may be okay to be considered competent if you have an 8% ICSI damage rate, but I certainly hope you don't consider that your benchmark um, as you know, losing almost one in, 20, in 10 eggs would not be, would not be considered um, a good result. So one thing I do want to touch on briefly is how you get your data for your LPIs and your KPIs. So I would hope that you do have a dynamic EMR that can generate these reports automatically. Uh, this is a sample from the EMR that I use at Ideas, but whichever EMR that you have, you should have the ability to run these reports for you. What you uh, don't want to have to resort to is an Excel spreadsheet where you have to retroactively enter data and potentially worry about data entry errors and long delays in getting it entered. So with those long delays in data entry, you may not realize you have an issue until many weeks or later or even longer. So the quicker you know you have a problem, the quicker you can investigate and correct it. So, and one of the things I'm gonna to touch on briefly, and I'm gonna show you a short, um, a short video, is uh, speaking of quick reports, a new area that we're working on developing is that that we call real-time analytics. So similar to your standard reports, but standard reports still require that you actually run them. So in real-time analytics, this is an example again from, from ideas in the system that we've termed smarts, but hopefully your EMR uses a, a similar tool. And this data is available live on a dashboard, so it doesn't need for you to run a report. You can color code the parameters and have visual cues when your values are out of range. So for example, in this rendering, my cleavage rate is only 82.2%. I've got that uh, coded as red, so certainly something I need to, to keep an eye on. But also, um, you know, that I would hopefully notice without having to have this dashboard, but something a bit more subtle is your ICSI 1PN rate of 3.9%. And this is certainly a marvelous tool for those lab directors that may not be on site. And I'm gonna show you in a second how you can render this on your mobile device as well. So let me just uh, switch my screens for a second. I'm gonna log in live to, to my dashboard system. Okay. All right, so can you guys see my new, my screen here? So unless somebody yes, tells yes, me, okay. Yeah. Perfect. 
So this is actually data that's running live from, from my test system, and I'm going to show you how it renders on my mobile device in a second. But this is something that you can have sitting on your dashboard of your computer. So ideally, as well, as I said before, if you're an off-site lab director, so this data will run live from the data that you've entered in the EMR. So you can filter it. You know, I have multiple years selected, but if I wanted to do the current year, um, you know, or let's just say I wanted to go back and look at 2018, you know, this data will update automatically. And just looking through the different views of this report that we can see, it, it automatically graphs and shows the, um, the bar charts of your fertilization rate. And all of this information can be, you know, sliced and diced in a variety of ways. You can see your fertilization rate based on what your benchmark level is, as well as your upper and lower um, limits, as well as your competency levels. And, you know, really, you know, obviously here, you know, very easily, if I'm using um, a real-time analytics dashboard, I see that all of a sudden in April, my fertilization rate has dropped to 71%. Now, if I was using, you know, an Excel spreadsheet where typically somebody's got to, after the cycles are complete, go and enter data, it might be to sometime in May that I find out that I had an issue in April. And by that time, my rates, whatever's happened, seems to have, have gone away, and my rates have already seemed to recover. So just one thing to, to think about. And the last thing, a couple things I want to show you here too, just looking at, you know, the ability to be able to look at your blast development. So again, here, this is test data to just kind of prove my point. But again, all of a sudden I've seen a huge drop, um, you know, in my blast conversion rate, but using a real-time analytic software, I can keep quickly an eye on that. So, you know, I can investigate this and address this, and hopefully it doesn't take me a month to bring that number back up. So one way to, to be able to use this quality control data to possibly improve your rates is even going into this dashboard. So here I have my ICSI fertilization rates broken down by technician. So, and I can see, you know, and we typically do this annually, but you know, here, and it typically takes a lot of work to get that data, but here I can see this live. I can see it live on a daily basis if I wanted to. And, but you can see from this technician here, Brianne, so this technician here, there is a significant difference, you know, in their fertilization rates. Now, in any of my labs, if I were to address this with, with any of my embryologists, you know the first thing that they're going to say is, well, I get all the hard cases, is I do all the tests, or I get all the older patients. And one of the tools that we built in is the, be able, is the ability to be able to adjust that by, by your criteria reference population. So I could take this data and say, okay, you know what? Maybe, you know, Gabino has, has a point. So I'm gonna sort this data. I would click on tests, but also, you know, maybe we're gonna, we're gonna bring this up to, to 39 years old, or, you know, we're gonna bring it up to, to 47 years old. And automatically that data readjusts itself. So if there, you know, if I readjust that, and there still is actually a true difference here in their ICSI for in their ICSI fertilization rates, then you know a system um, that you could design is having this technician, this technologist, kind of act as like the teacher for these embryologists. I don't want to refer to them as juniors, but I would hope these are the junior technicians and not your senior ones. But you know, to develop videotape this person, try to see if there's something subtle that they're doing in their ICSI, because if they're you know routinely achieving over a 90% ICSI rate, which I have seen in some labs you know, where their benchmark might be 70%, but, you know, you have got one stellar embryologist that's consistently getting over 90, you really want to maximize that person and have them teach your other embryologists and, you know, have them sit with and work with these embryologists. So not only can you bring their levels up, but that you could raise the entire benchmark from your lab. So, you know, maybe this year your benchmark or your average, you know, was 80%, and that's about what you met, but using techniques like this, you should be able to, um, to accelerate those levels and to bring them up over time. So, all right. So now back to our last slide. And thank you. So, okay, Edith. Thank you very much for, for all of that. Now, I'm conscious we've got a couple of uh, speakers today. So I'm just going to throw maybe um, uh, one question at you. This is okay. from Anastasia, um, who would like to know if the if the embryologist is working perfume, wearing perfume in the lab um, when he or she is checking the progress of the embryos, can that affect them? Is the absolutely. perfume toxic? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Anything we can smell, um, you know, that 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 has a certain chemical component. 
um, you know, I, I've honestly never worked in, in labs that, that allow any perfumes. We typically even, you know, very old school would have our patients who were coming in for retrieval and transfer. It's not only were no perfumes, but, you know, back in the day, we even told them not to have any nail polish on. But certainly you need to, um, you know, to limit, um, you know, perfume and stuff that's, that's allowed on, on any of the embryologists that are in your lab. Okay, and uh, we just got a very nice message from you here from Chandra Schechter, who says, a, a very nice lecture, ma'am. So how about that? Oh, thank you very much. Fantastic. Well, listen, uh, Eva, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, and um, just in the interest of time, I am going to move on, but please do stay on the line because we might get a few more questions towards the end. We've got uh, 75 attendees at the moment, so it's looking absolutely fantastic. But um, I am conscious now we need to move from the USA all the way over to Iran. And it gives me the greatest pleasure to introduce Dr. Matab Karimi all the way um, from Sari in, in Iran. Uh, she is a gynecologist and obstetrician with extensive experience in the diagnosis and treatment of a wide range of um, women's diseases, especially those of uh, the rep female reproductive system. So, um, uh, with that uh, in mind, uh, maybe we can just uh, switch over from um, either slides over to um, Matab slides, um, uh, if we're able to do that. And I can see Matab there. Thank you for uh, for joining us. And if we can just switch over to her slides, I'll ask you to just go straight away. Matab, all the way over to you. No, Matab, we can't hear you. You might just need to unmute yourself. Okay. Is it now okay? Now we can hear you. Um, and if we can just see your slides, that'd be okay. good. Yes, yes. Hello. Hello, everyone. And thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Professor. Starring Griffin, that let me have this um, webinar speaking, and um, my um, topic is about um, infertility surgery before embryo transfer. And um, okay, excuse me. Uh, can you see my slide? Uh, yes, we can now, yes, but you've got the conclusion okay. slide up at the moment, so just go to the front yes, there. Yes, yes. Uh, surgical infertility treatment overview, I want to speak about it. It's um, um, a large um, um, document about uh, infertility. We have a lot, a lot of documents about surgical infertility treatment, but fertility surgery involves an operating procedures for men or women to correct a structural issue causing infertility, as you know, uh, which may be due to a condition. Some causes of infertility in women that can be corrected by surgery include uh, endometriosis, fibroids, polyps, and other problems in the reproductive organs. For men, uh, you know, fertility surgery can treat varicocele or reserve a vasectomy. But uh, I will speak about uh, women's um, uh, surgical infertility treatment in this week. And hysteroscopy or laparoscopy are the two most common surgical approaches for female infertility surgery. Fibroids, um, polyps, and uterine adhesions, uterine anomaly disorders, are um, the most important problems in infertility. And um, you can see in this picture, uh, for example, here, adhesions, endometrioma. In this picture, you see the fibroma in all parts of the uterine, uh, cavity and uterine bulb. This is the tubes, as you know, and this is the ovary. This is the uterine cavity. This is the adhesions that in, uh, it's in the uterine cavity. This is polyps pictures that may involve all the um, part of the uterus, for example, in the um, fundal part or anterior, posterior, and lateral uh, part of the uterine valve. We can see the polyps, or even in the osteum or cervical openings, we see polyps sometimes. 
And in this picture, we have uh, a patient and a syndrome in this uh, uterine, and it, this is hysterosalpingography picture, as you see. For some fertility cases, reproductive surgery is um, required for patients to achieve their optimal fertility success. At IVF clinic, our goal is to provide you with the least invasive procedure possible. Technological advance advancement enable our physicians to perform delicate surgical surgery in a minimal invasive manner with most procedure lasting less than an hour. As you know, um, a minimal invasive manner is better than, um, for example, laparotomy for mummy, laparotomy for uh, endometriosis. Endometriosis, ovarian cysts, pelvic and intrauterine adhesions, uterine fibroids, endometrial polyps, fallopian tube disease, and obstruction or hydrosalpines, congenital anomalies of the pelvic organs, such as uterine or vaginal septum. Fibroids are the most uh, common uh, disease in the uterus. Leomyomas or myomas is the other, are the other names, and are begin. And non cancerous tumors made up of smooth muscles that usually grow in the uh, uterine bars. Fibroids may cause heavy menstrual flow and severe cramping, pelvic pressure on bladder, or uh, even bowel problems. Depending on their location, size, and growth rate, fibroids can also interfere with conception and pregnancy. This is the picture as you, show, you see before. Pelvic examination uh, is the most uh, common way to diagnose the uh, size of the uterus, uh, uterine and um, size of the fibroma plate um, and um, the, how large is the fibroma we can uh, see in pelvic examination. If the secret tumor or tumors are very large, they may be felt on pelvic examination sometimes, even the patient um, uh, tell us that my abdomen is um, larger than before, or my abdomen, um, I, I feel a thing in my abdominal cavity, or a pressure in my, when I want, um, when I want uh, to uh, have the urination, and uh, maybe in um, bubble obstruction, for example, constipation, the patients say us about uh, the pressure of the uterine in the abdominal cavity. Routine, pel routine pelvic ultrasound. This is a transvaginal ultrasound that you use to view the leaning uh, of the uterus. It is usually the best way to see a figure for the ultrasound that deserves a slim probe in the uh, it is uh, named the transducer and into the vagina in order to evaluate the potential effect on the uterine cavity. The ultrasound should be performed shortly before ovulation when the endometrial leaning is at its thickest. Mm, in this picture, you see uh, intercavity uh, fibroma that is called um, submucosal fibroma. That it may interfere with embryo transfer. Then we want to transfer the embryo with the catheter, for example, with cook, with cook, cook catheter in this comic scanning. Uh, after uh, inserting the spatula, uh, we want to insert the catheter from here. It's uh, it's the opening of the cervical canal. And when we want to insert the catheter from here, we see the pressure or a difficulty in inserting insertion of the catheter to the cavity. Sometimes it is intramural um, fibroma that is here, or sometimes um, intramural here or even here. But the size and how it has pressure on the cavity is very important. Sometimes we have subserosal fibroma. That the subserosal fibroma don't interfere with our embryo transfer, as you know. Uh, the most important fibroma that we should consider in embryo transfer it is intracavity or submucosal fibroma that may interfere, um, interfere with our transfer. Even the fibroma may um, produce some inflammation factors or uh, interfere with blood supply to the uterine valve 
and um, maybe cause the um, abortion, miscarriage, or even uh, it, cause, uh, it will cause the you know, bad processing of the embryo and uh, maybe negative results. Uh, Histosolongram is another way to consider or see the cavity of the um, uterine, and um, we see submucosal trauma in this um, procedure, histosolongram ultrasound. It may, um, with vaginal ultrasound, we see when inject style saline into the cavity and the saline serves to the enlarge the uterus and also make it easier to see the measure and size of the fibro and even the place of the fibro in the uterine cavity. Um, it is best used to visualize submucosal trauma those within the uterine cavity. Hysteroscopy is another way and is a minor surgical procedure that involves placing a lighted telescopic instrument into the cavity from a uterine service and visualize uh, any abnormalities within the wall of the uterine cavity or fibroid is seen in the cavity. And in this procedure, surgical hysteroscopy, we can even um, reject the fibroma, submucosal fibroma from the cavity. And it's um, a procedure, diagnostic and surgical procedure. MRI is another procedure. Mm, that we can uh, see in MRI the size of the uterine cavity, the place, the exact place, the fibroid in the cavity, or the sometimes pressure of the fibro or any other mass, uh, for example, atmospheric mass into the cavity we can see in MRI. Treating fibroids, there are a lot of uh, treating fibroids. A way to treat people is sometimes surgical, sometimes medical. In a surgical procedure called myomectomy, the people can be removed, preserving the uterus and ovaries so that construction can occur. There are various methods and uh, to perform myomectomy depends on the location, size, and number of the people. Sometimes the um, uh, the patient is selected and one patient to another patient. It um, may um, differ, uh, differ. Myometrome with laparoscopy, myometrome with laparoscopy, myometrome with hysteroscopy. There are a lot of ways, but you know, laparotomy is um, a surgery and uh, uh, it's not minimally major procedure and involving uh, a large incision through the abdominal wall. This abdominal myomectomy is the best approach for large and multiple fibroids within the muscle wall of the uterus. The surgical procedure, procedure can be performed by most our gynecologist surgeons, of course, as uh, this is a major abdominal surgery and um, it's not um, uh, in minimal invasive surgery, for, for example, laparoscopy. Myomectomy with hysteroscope is a um, hysteroscopic projection of um, fibroma in the uterine cavity. It, it is a uh, submucosal fibroma. And uh, as you know, the thin lighted telescope filled from the vagina and um, cervical opening. The hysteroscope is fitted with a specific surgical instrument and enabling the physician to view and remove the fibroid. This surgery must be done by gynecologist with adequate training in microscopy like IVF specialist, infertility specialist surgeon. As no incision are involved, um, it is usually performed as a day surgery with no overnight hospital stay. Myomectomy with laparoscopy means laparoscopy with myomectomy. This procedure uses a laparoscope and one or more small incision in the abdomen and with trocar, with laparoscopy with trocar, we uh, go to um, abdominal cavity and it is a minimally invasive procedure and uh, it needs to special training by a gynecologic surgeon and in recent years laparoscopic surgeons are also starting to use robotic assist surgery and this has been especially helpful for myomectomy. And uterine artery embolization, as you hear before, is related to the procedure of 
partners, but because long-term effects are still being studied. It is not yet recommended for women who want to preserve their fertility, for example, uh, virgin woman or a woman to um, a pregnancy after uh, treatment, uh, we don't recommend this renal embolization. And uh, in this embolization, as you know, procedure blood before its blood supply by injecting the small particles into the arteries and uh, arteries that supply the before its um, blood. And um, because uh, it has a lot of adverse um, and, uh, for example, adhesions or even in pregnancy, rupture the uterus of um, uh, placenta accurata is the adverse. Endometrial polyp um, is a small, benign overgrowth of the normal tissue leaning the uterus, the endometrial, and many women have polyps but may have no symptoms and never know they have even um, polyps. And they are very common in women in their 30 and 40 and can probably cause infertility. Uh, anything that interferes with uh, uterine cavity blood supply or occupying lesion in the uterine cavity will be rejected before embryo transfer. As you know, uh, to diagnose polyps, root vaginal ultrasound of the prior to ovulation is usually sufficient to diagnose polyps. If unclear, a hysterosomendram or hysteroscopy, um, we can see and endometrial polyps are often missed and hysterosal because the radio effect diabolizes the visualization. It is a polyp, a polyp in the uterine cavity, and uh, uh, you know that um, the resectoscopy, the hysteroscopy resectoscopy, we can um, um, reject the polyp. Treating polyps are successfully treated with hysteroscopy, and the patient. I uh, can try to conceive immediately after the polyp is removed. Uh, another surgery is using a scar tissue, sometimes particularly after a dilatation and shortage procedure, or sometimes after cesarean section, or sometimes uh, after D and C, uh, the Usherman syndrome will occur. This type of scarring may take it difficult or impossible for an embryo to implant in the uterus, sometimes in. Uh, patients we have in new century. As you know, the um, cesarean is usually in women, and um, any cesarean scar in the uterine cavity uh, may be, may be cause uh, a niche in the cesarean section, and it is um, a scar that may interfere with embryo transfer because uh, it may uh, produce inflammation factor in um, or sometimes even blood in the niche scar and uh, the patient have bleeding or attacking between the menstrual cycle and we should um, treat this niche syndrome and after that we can do the embryo transfer. Diagnosing uterine scarring with sonogram, hysterosonogram, hysteroscopy or hysterosalpangography can be used to diagnose. And treating is hysteroscopy with resections of the scars. Usherman, uh, as you know, it is the uterine scar and may, um, may be um, the cause of the patient after the pregnancy, maybe uh, placenta paravia or other placenta abruption uh, is in Usherman syndrome. Sometimes it may cause uh, missed abortion or even multiple abortion. One patient has a complication, complication of abortion after, after amniocentesis, and the last one, woman underwent abortion because of the thyroid problem. After treatment of Ashama syndrome in an study, um, it is here. Conclusion is that comprehensive management of promising reproductive outcomes for impartial women with severe Ashama syndrome will be treated and then after that we can uh, do embryo transfer. Adhesion is the most important factor which suffers hypermolytic activities and promote adhesion formation. A lot of cows um, is the cause of adhesion and um, 
Um, it is first uh, port found just above the target of dissection, tissue ischemia, prolonged operation, and um, visceral injury, drying or sterile factor, blood plus fraction of tracinol, history of infection, cavity endometriosis, and um, previous intra-abdominal trauma or bleeding, ectopic pregnancy, surgery for appendices, vehicle accident, motor vehicle accident, enhancing sus, uh, success of ARP uh, with um, surgery of um, adhesions is um, uh, very important. Surgical gloves powder even may cause adhesion in the cavity or in a uterine cavity. It is the picture of adhesion you see here, and it's the bond and uh, the adhesion, and it is uh, the adhesion between anterior and posterior wall of the uterine cavity. And in hysteroscopy, we can uh, resist uh, this adhesion with seizure. And this is another adhesion you see here ovaries, here the abdominal wall, here, here is the uterine, and it is the ligament uh, and tube. This site is the adhesion site, and we should treat this adhesion with embryo so because it may interfere with uh, embryo and not transferring the embryo, but uh, it may cause missed abortion or sometimes in endometriosis it may cause IVF failure. And um, prevention of adhesion is not necessary to know for uh, you, but adhesion prevention techniques is gentle tissue handling in surgery, use of barrier agents, and minimal blood loss. Uh, or uh, when we want to do surgery, we can use um, uh, gloves without powdery and uh, antibiotic barrier, anti islamic homes, and a lot of medication that we use in surgery for preventing adhesion. For example, when, do, when we do myomectomy, abdominal myomectomy, we should consider adhesion when a patient wants to have embryo transfer after myomectomy, or the patient wants to uh, even have pregnancy after that, we should um, do the best way for surgery. Sometimes the method of surgery of a, of a surgeon is very important when the surgeon uh, um, is cautious about the uh, surgery and adhesion prevention techniques is required to uh, do for the women who want to have baby or pregnancy after the myomectomy or any other laparotomy. Um, another way is um, laparoscopic procedure in laparoscopy uh, is essential to restore normal tubo ovarian anatomic size relationship. In uh, this procedure, we uh, leave the adhesion with um, resection by seizure in laparoscopy, or sometimes we uh, do surgery to uh, form the tubo ovarian anatomical places or relationships, sometimes in endometriosis or um, uh, ovarian cysts or in myoma um, or any other, for example, ectopic pregnancy or um, 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 tubo ovarian abscess. We see a lot of adhesions or sometimes we see frozen pelvis that um, the, the um, uh, surgeon should notice uh, to this procedure and in surgery, you know, we should um, have um, enough um, enough uh, experiment to do the surgery, to do the best way for surgery, because the patient after the surgery wants to be pregnant. And this adhesion sometimes requires use of energy, unipolar, bipolar, ultrasonic, for example, harmonic surgery. And after achieving hemostasis, sharp dissection with seizures are necessary. After accessionally, some fluid can be left inside the, in the cavity, in the abdominal cavity, to prevent recurrence or high molecular weight, dextra and try to prevent reaction. And the fertility results after accessionally are better with the state of the adhesion. And another. Um, Situation. Some we sometimes we see in uh, patients uterine congenital anomalies, rare 
cases, women may be born with a uterus that has a vertical septum and separate uterus. Or sometimes in patients who have um, multiple pregnancy loss or multiple abortion or something more than three abortion, we see uh, separate uterus. Or even a duplication of the <clears throat> if the uterine be delicate. Depending on the severity, surgery may be recommended. Diagnostic is um, uh, the procedure for diagnosis of congenital anomalies is ultrasound, hysterosonogram, hysteroscopy, hysterosal sangography sometimes can be used to diagnose any of these types of uterine anatomic disorder. Treating is hysteroscopy with resection of septum, or sometimes in the um, uh, we see in laparoscopy for a uterine duplication surgery is not usually required, but avoidance of twins is very important because of the much greater risk of preterm labor or preterm delivery. Sometimes we see um, multiple uh, pregnancy or twin or triple in um, didn't fetus, and we should consider um, to um, redux one of the um, bryos and in nine or eight weeks of pregnancy because of the risk of preterm labor. Uh, in this picture, you see normal cavity, uterine cavity. This is the diddle case, a uterus. This is the arcuate, and um, you know uh, that arcuate uterus um, can interfere with embryo transfer, unicorn, and bicornate you see, and this is septate. But the most um, state is the septate. In septate, we do hysteroscopy and we reject the septum from here. After three months, we can um, uh, we can do embryo transfer. Or even the patient who don't have um, infertility can be pregnant after three, after three months. Um, in conclusion, although the optimal treatment cannot presently be proposed, there is insufficient evidence to support the strategy, a strategy of systematic surgical treatment of endometriosis or another problem or surgery before IVF uh, and um, cycles and embryo transfer. As you know, patient uh, and a case is uh, um, different to another case, and the doctor should consider the, um, any case different to another case. This is the hysterosalpangography and the Asherman syndrome, as in, in, you see this in this uh, picture. This is the acutifying lesion, maybe adhesion, maybe polyps, maybe fibroids, but this is Asherman syndrome after three uh, D and C and quarters. Um, Hydrosalpines is the most uh, common seed that we see in our patients produce an adverse infection results on in IVF. Removal of the hydrosalpines will improve IVF success. As you know, the surgeon has to distinguish between the pathological finding according to the site which is affected. Uh, and these are the site distal tube obstruction, complete or incomplete, hydrosalpines, ismocornal black complete or incomplete, any combination of the previous three categories, or create two bar or periovariant adhesions may be in this. Sulfangectomy is the most widely used treatment for hydrosulfide. Uh, for example, a patient who have endometriosis or before um, surgery, for example, the patient has um, sulfangectomy or uh, cyst um, laparotomy or endometriosis or PID, pelvic inflammation disorder, or any other uh, problem that may cause heterosalpine, we should treat heterosalpine before embryo transfer, and then um, <clears throat> we can uh, transfer the embryo. As you know, heterosalpine um, will uh, have um, uh, some fluid in the tube, and this fluid may um, interfere with our transfer, embryo transfer, and maybe um, uh, reverse um, come to the uterine cavity and may um, have inflammation in the cavity and may interfere with 
transfer. This, in this picture, you see left is the hydrosulfine, and it is the tubes, as you know, in hydrosulfines, the blockage will be the cause of the hydrosulfine. Surgical treatment for hydrosulfide prior to IV or MRI transfer in this um, meta analysis, uh, proximal tube occlusion, sulfangectomy, and aspiration for treatment or hydrosulfide transfer consistently better than this not intervention for the outcome of IV. Uh, it means that we should treat hydrosulfide before the MRI transfer. Patients uh, appear to be the most effective intervention followed by sulfangectomy. And um, in this picture, it is a hydrosulfan graph um, that you see the uterine cavity. Here is the uterine, here is the tubes, and here the tubes. The both tubes here have uh, hydrosulfines, and uh, when we transfer the embryo from here to the uterine cavity, this fluid is in the hydrosulfan and can come back to the cavity. It may interfere and is, it is the most common cause in, in the net tumor and may interfere with a pregnancy or as a failure. Thank you, thank you um, for listening and thank you, uh, Professor Darren Garifer and um, all the IBS company let me to have this seminar and excuse me for uh, bad internet or network here maybe disconnecting the voice or thank you okay thank you Mahtab. that was um uh really enlightening uh now in the interest of time i'll ask you one question if that's okay um yeah. and this is from uh, dr um Satiawan, uh, and yeah. they ask, is it right to do scratching of the endometrium? So endometrial scratching, a yes. few days before yes. embryo transfer, is it helpful? Yes, yes, endometrial scratching is, um, is done with hysteroscopy, and we, um, we do this uh, for, in our clinic, we do uh, for patients who have uh, rectified their failure or for uh, two, or three times embryo transfer, uh, we do endometrial scratching and the fundal uh, of the cat, uh, uterine cavity in the local part of the um, uh, patients, and it may it may um, uh, have a more success rate, um, about ten percent more success rate, um, and uh, it is used in our clinic in some. In some um, lectures or um, uh, journals, um, it was uh, it, it doesn't have any uh, successful rate. But in our clinic, we do it, and um, uh, it is recommend that it's we recommend that um, after two or three embryo transfer and repeat IVF failure, we do uh, endometrial scratch, and it may. Um, have a higher um, positive rate. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Maktab. Uh, right, Thank so in the interest you. of time, everyone, um, that just uh, um, leads me to, first of all, to thank both of our speakers for some uh, a very interesting talks there. And at this point, I'm going to pass over to Mayas, who's going to tell us a little bit about some of our IVF and PGT courses. So, Mayas, over to you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I would like to uh, tell you about our courses that are designed and certified by the University of Kent, uh, the IVF and PGT courses, and they are brought to you all the way from UK by the IVF company and hosted by Tri-C Academy. These courses will start next week in the 22nd of March. They are basically uh, nine weeks uh, courses, um, uh, eight weeks online, and one week will be later in Dubai for the practical in our training center. If you want to find out uh, any more information about the courses, you can just download the handouts that are attached to the webinar, 
and for any information you can contact us directly if you need any more explanations thank you so much excellent thank you very much uh Mayas. so listen we are somewhat over time here uh it's been fantastic thank you all for staying with us today because we've gone a little bit over time uh it's been lovely to have you there's been uh 60 70 of you uh, at some point uh, uh i'm just going to see if any of my um co-workers would like to anything else so shaddy do you want to add anything else at this stage uh uh uh, hello guys sorry i am in my car so i i uh, uh, i i i'm okay uh, thank you very much it was uh, interesting to see that uh, even dr uh, muhtab from iran managed to get the uh, barrier language and translate from iranian to english and share with us so everybody was bearing that in mind so thank you dr muhtab and thank you my friend dr eva in new york it was amazing and I just want to say thank you, University of Kent and Professor Darren and the team and Dr. Giuseppe and Dr. Mayas. Thank you, guys. Uh, I'm, I'm traveling to Abu Dhabi. Uh, thank thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Shadi. And just to add that um, uh, Dr. Maktab was uh, uh, streaming that through Facebook at the same time and had one and a half thousand likes as a result of, uh, of her efforts today. So we're very grateful to that. Um, we're really pleased to be reaching out to the US and to Iran. And as you know, we are very much uh, an international company, very much an international university. And we would very much like you to be joining us on our spirit of adventure here, not only for our online courses, but also to come and join us in Dubai at our training center when it opens. So with that in mind, thank you, Shadi. Thank you, Mayas. Thank you, Melissa, of course. And thank you, but most importantly, thank you to our two speakers, Maktab and to Eva for a fantastic time. Uh, and we will see you all again next week um, where, um, or in a couple of weeks time when we'll be hearing from Dr. Sami al Musawasa. Um, from ARCGH, from IVF, from start to finish. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Cheers. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.